In this video, I'll show you the common mistakes React developers make that will prevent them from getting a job in 2025. I do a lot of code reviews for front-end engineering positions and I see these red flags in React constantly. I want to help you avoid these red flags and I want to help you land the job and pass the interview. The first problem I see is not understanding or using functional programming. We want to use functional programming if we want to write with React. And that means that we want to use methods like map or filter or reduce or sum every all. There's lots of these methods here that can be used in react in javascript and typescript and that they will make your life easier so let's for example go through this to do's here we have some to do's and we want to get only the incomplete to do's and we have two functions here and i'll show you this one and i'll uncomment it but let's go through the imperative approach we declare an incomplete to do's constant then we go through all the to do's that we have and we add the incomplete to do and then we return the to do's this makes sense but this is bad code we want to use functional programming patterns and we want to use filter here instead of going and doing this imperatively. We want to avoid mutating data. We want immutability and not mutability. And the better approach here would be to remove this, dump this and never show this to anyone and actually use this approach. And this is a functional programming approach, which does the following. We send the to-dos, we go through all of our to-dos, we filter out, we get only the completed property, which is going to be true or false. And then we return the ones that are false. And we now we have a one-liner that does all the heavy lifting. It's clean and it's easy to understand. And if we go back to the imperative approach, you see that we have, what is this? This is 10 lines of code written in an imperative way that is not readable and not not maintainable. The second mistake I see is using lots of use state hooks. There's no reason to use lots of use state hooks for every property that we see. So for example, if we have a form here and it has a first name and last name and a username, we don't need a use state for each of the property. It makes it un unmaintainable. The code will not be maintainable after some time. Let's say we add address, then a geolocation, and then maybe an email, a phone number. You can see that the form is growing and so is the use state. We don't want to have that many use state lines for example we have 15 properties we don't want 15 use state lines the proper way to do this is to group the use state into logical data so for example if we have a user we're going to group it and we're going to have the first name last name and username in one use state hook if we have address we're going to add a new type here below it's going to say address and then we're going to add the address inside a new use state and that way we have separation and we have maintainability which is what we want. When you add separation and when you group these things in logical components, you can then add functions that do lots of heavy lifting. So for example, we have a function here that updates the user info. I can just pass the value and I can pass which property to update and it handles it for me. This makes your code not repeat itself, which is one of the fundamental things that we want to have in our code base. So we can update the user info with this function here, with, with, which calls the hook here at the top. And then we can easily display any data that we want. Also, we can have type safety, which is really nice. So if I try to update a field that doesn't exist here, I can't. It's going to complain because we added the key of user here for the field. So this is a very important thing to do. But if I turn this into a field that does exist in our object, we don't get any complaints anymore. So use use state responsibly and group it into logical pieces. The third mistake, again, for use state is using use state for everything. We don't need to use use state for everything if we can derive some values. So for example, let's see this bad example here of a timer. We have seconds, minutes, and hours as a state. And when the second changes, we also update the minutes. And then when the minutes change, we update the hours. Which makes sense, right? And we have an example here of a timer that changes and modifies and formats the seconds, the minutes, and the hours. But the problem here is we have two unnecessary use states and use effect hooks that we don't need. It makes sense to a beginner maybe to look at this and says oh well when the seconds change we only want the minutes to change but this adds unnecessary complexity and it ruins the readability of the code a way better way to handle this is just to derive state and not you and not place it in a use state hook so we have the right state here and we have seconds and from seconds we can get the minutes by dividing the seconds by 60. We can get the hours by dividing the minutes by 60 and we don't need to have any use state. This is going to work perfectly fine and it's going to run also perfectly fine because you have to understand beginners make this assumption that just adding lines won't cost anything. Yes, it will. And most senior engineers and people that write code and that write code in a good way will tell you less is more. The less lines you have, 
the better it is and most likely it will be faster. So keep in mind, you always want to use a less use state if you can derive these values. So here we have a clean example. And if, if you compare these two functions here, the good timer and the bad timer, you can clearly see that this here just strains your eyes and sees that there's unnecessary complexity when you can just derive the state and then show it at the bottom. The fourth mistake is inverting hot water. I would call it like that because we have common patterns and trivial problems that are solved every day. And we don't want to solve this from zero. So for example, let's say you want to program something. You don't want to write in assembly and then write in C and then in C++ and then in Java and then so on. You just want to get the tool to write the business logic because you don't have to care about everything else. It's like inventing wheel before a wheel before going and driving a car. It makes no sense. So let's see a bad example here. Let's say I tell you to write a form and then I give you something else to do with the form. A bad example would be if you just started writing the code without actually thinking, hey, maybe there's a common solution to this. This also is tied to patterns, but this is out of the scope of this video. But let's say we have a common solution for this. I'm not going to think about that and I'm just going to write the code. So I'm going to write the code. I'm going to add the types here. I'm going to then write the form, add the inputs. And then since I wrote so much code and I thought about it and I added the functions, I'm also going to say, well, we have to add validation here and actually show these errors. And then we have to add a submit. And then here we have to submit the form and then maybe send it to some other server and let something else happen. And then maybe send another request to get the data. You see how complex such a simple form can become. And instead of just going in, starting and writing everything from scratch, you have to think to yourself, hey, maybe I can implement this using something else, right? Maybe I can use a form library that already exists and is battle tested. So for this example, we're going to be using React hook form. I'm going to replace this and we're going to say it's a good form and we're going to import this. So good form. And we're going to use React hook form that will solve the trivial problems that we have. We already know how forms work. We already know how to handle data. We already know how to submit the data. We don't want to reinvent the wheel and reinvent hot water. So if we add React hook form here, we can just register an input, add its error. We can also add validation here. We can register the password. We can add the error and we can submit. Here is a handle submit function and that gives us the form values and we're done. We don't need to write and reinvent and then complicate everything because the more code you write, the more complex it's going to be because it's going to become and the more complex it becomes it's unmaintainable and then you have your development time is halved and even it's your development time decreases the more complexity that you have so you want to lessen that you want to decrease that and you want to use common solutions for problems so for this problem we just use a form library that's tested we implement it and then we move to the next problem and go solve it. The fifth problem is really simple. It's using JavaScript today. If you use JavaScript in 2025, you should stop. You should learn TypeScript. It's a necessity. You have to learn TypeScript. Any code reviews that I have to do, and I see JavaScript for that developer that applied for the job, I look at it, but I look at it with a sense of why is this, why did this person use JavaScript when they could use TypeScript? They TypeScript has so many benefits that it's it's even hard to to mention if i start mentioning mentioning them i would be i would have to make a 2 hour video let's just, let me just give you a simple example we can have types we can type our data we can check if something's not working and not have to break our head if if something stops we can have safety here so in our third i think or fourth example yeah now fourth example we can see that we can add the key off here so that we can have autocomplete and that it works. We have type safety so I don't pass something else that doesn't exist for this use state. TypeScript is the norm now. We have to use it. It helps us a lot. It solves our problems. It helps us debug. And if you're using JavaScript, you have to switch and learn TypeScript because it will make you 10 times the developer. It will help you write things quicker and write things safer. And safety is a very big thing. We don't want our application to crash the users because that's 
that's the lowest point that we can go to. The sixth mistake that I see, and I see this commonly, is prop drilling. You may think, oh, well, I don't do prop drilling. It's uh, fairly common. Well, prop drilling can be avoided. I, this never happened to me, but I think it does. It happens to everyone. I also did this. Everyone did this. Prop drilling is a very common problem that people don't solve efficiently. And prop drilling requires not just writing the code, but thinking about the entire ar architecture of the app. So instead of having this example where we have a dashboard and we have a shopping cart and the dashboard is showing the shopping cart and passing the items to it, and then the shopping cart has its content, which the shopping cart is going to pass the items to it, and then the shopping cart content has a bad, has an item list where it will show the items and it pass, passes the content and then we actually display the items. This is not only bad for see, seeing the code and understanding what's happening and the architecture and the file structure and the components and the build time, it's also really bad for performance because if something changes in the dashboard, everything is going to be re-rendered in the shopping cart in the shopping cart content and in the item list. So this is bad on all kinds of levels. So to avoid that is just use React content or a state management library like Zustand. That's literally it. You think of the architecture, you look at it from a bird's eye view and you see, oh, well, this is a common thing. Well, we will have, a, we will have these shopping items shown throughout the application. So let's maybe put this in a global state and you can use React context or a state manage li management library. So let's see how simple this example is. We have a store here that you can create. And this is how easy you can create the store. You can add methods for adding items or removing them from the shopping cart. And then in our shopping cart items function, component where we can place it anywhere in the app, we can just get the items and show them. And whenever these items change, this will be the fresh items that we actually updated. So as you can see, this example, and this is a no-brainer. If you have any prop drilling, you have to replace it and refactor it and fix it because this is not going to land you a job. This is not going to help you with performance, and this is not going to make you a professional and a better React developer or an engineer in any sort of front-end framework or library. And the seventh and the final mistake here is bad file structure and code architect. I have this bulletproof React on the side here and we're going to go through it a bit in a moment first i want to show you something when i get sent a pr and i see the code changes that the person made and i go to the file structure and i see everything in one directory and nothing is organized we also have bad naming conventions so something is pascal case something is param case something is snake case i also don't see any directories for hooks for constants, for types. And I don't see any standard handling of, for example, errors. It's not even worth looking at the code. We don't want to do that. We want standardized inputs, standardized outputs. We want predictability. So if, for example, we can add a features directory and inside the features directory, we can add the constants and so on what we need. Also, if we add a constants directory, if I can spell this constants, we want to have a convention here. So I want to say this is the global constants that we use. We're going to say global.ts and inside of here we want to get a constant naming convention. So we're going to say export const uh, let's say number default number and it's going to be five. We want to use this screaming case I think it's called for every constant in our application. So we add a readme document at the top of our app, which every project should have. And then we say, for constants, we will be using screaming case and you will enforce that through the entire application. There's no reason to have a constant that has default number to five. And then we export another constant that says default time to 12. This, this, is, this is funny, right? This is not, not maintainable and not good on the eyes. And if you can't read the code, you're going to be wasting your time looking at it while someone outperforms you that has a clean code. So we have we have default time, 12, and we have default number to five. This, this inconsistency is a very big problem in a red flag. And the same thing goes for types, for hooks, for anything else. Not using custom hooks that you made that, you, that helps you with your business logic. That's, these are mistakes that will cost you your job. What I recommend for you to do is go to Bulletproof React, and I'm going to leave a link in the description, and read this. This repository is very nice. It helped me a lot. 
it it i recommend this to everyone that uh, wants to write react and wants to maintain react react is not opinionated like other for example frameworks uh, like angular angular is very opinionated opinionated and you can move through angular a bit easier once you get going and you understand what happens but with react you have to do it manually you have to use your own code structure and your own conventions so Bulletproof React goes through all of this. So for example, it goes to project structure and it helps you create a structure that is actually maintainable. So for example, you can see the source folder, then the app, and then you can see that it's feature based. And in these features, you can add other directories like hook, library, stores, testing, and you don't have to follow this strictly, but you should use this as a baseline for your project. You also have security. You have state management, how they handle state management. They talk about use state, use reducer. They also talk about these common state management libraries like I told you about, Zustan, Yotai, Xstate, and so on. They also talk about React Query. So this reading Bulletproof React will make you stand out of the rest of the people that did not read this and that, that don't understand this. So read Bulletproof React, go over to the last six mistakes I mentioned. And if you got, and if you understand these mistakes and don't make them, you're good to go. You're eventually, when you get to an interview, you'll pass it with flying colors. You'll impress everyone. And that's what we want today. That's what I want you to become so you can get the job. And until next time, bye.